I am Robert Allen Rotherman. Uh, my mother wanted that name, and, and then that way I could always be called from Robert to Bob, so I left it at that. Born 1941, uh, July 1941, and uh, not aware of the fact that uh, I was uh, one of the youngest of eight boys, and uh, I had a sister that was younger than me, and, and uh, five sisters, and uh, you know, having that many brothers and beating up on you every now and then, that, that was fun. Well, uh, I was really born and raised on a farm in uh, North Platte, Nebraska, and uh, moved to another farm uh, was in Springfield, Nebraska, where my dad uh, farmed uh, 250 acres of land. We had all the animals, the chickens, cows, pigs, everything, and, and, uh, and all of us had a job to do, and my job was collecting eggs, and that's about as much as I want to go in to that. So uh, we lived far away from uh, the nearest town, which was Springfield, Nebraska. And the only way you could get there is by either horse or buggy, or you had an old Model T car that would get you there and back, um, and then go to back, come back from where you were and, and uh, get ready to go back to work and doing what you got to do on a farm. Well, my dad's name was uh, Albert, and they all called him Al. Uh, my mom's name was Martha. And uh, what he did was uh, he, he ran the show on the farm and he was a very uh, hard worker working six hours uh, just plowing and, and chucking corn or whatever. And, and as I kind of grew up uh, close to that, my dad would uh, kind of lead the way for guys my, at my age, which I really took an interest in a farm and, and uh, do the things that I had to do and uh, chores wise. And, and then uh, trying to take care of going to school and things like that. Well, my dad had tra had two plow horses that he trained. He'd whistle once and the dog, uh, the horses would go, we were pulling a wagon, chucking corn, and, the, and he'd whistle again, the, co the, the horses would stop. So we had to keep moving and, and keep chucking corn and throwing in the wagon, and that's the way it was. And uh, as far as my dad is concerned, he was one of the hardest working guys. I mean, he'd go from daylight to dark, and and uh, and my and my mom was uh, just a great mom. She took care of the kids basically. And I, I remember one time I tried my dad, and he took me to the tool shed and gave me a good whipping, and uh, that was the last time I saw that myself in the tool shed, because if I made a mistake, did something wrong, and he had been told before then he would make sure that I got the message about what, the way it's supposed to be. So that's the way I was growing up on that part. I always had a, 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 a real scare tactic or something, whatever it may call. But uh, when he told me not to do something that I wasn't supposed to do, then that's what I did. I listened to what he had to say. My dad was, uh, was like a one-man gang. He, he did so much of the work and he, uh, when he told his sons that uh, who, who he was, he was a man that he was a hard worker. He loved his his kids, and uh, my dad was uh, a man that uh, wanted to make sure that uh, he was bringing us up right and, and doing the things that we were told to do. And that's the only way we could, uh, you know. My dad was just a guy. You just had to make sure that you were going to be doing things that he expected you to do. And he was a leader. To me, he was a leader, which I think I got where I played football, what it meant to be a leader. And that was to be like my dad. My mom was just a kind of a person that her life, uh, the way it was when she came up, she would always let us know a little bit about what she was like when she was a little girl growing up. But she always wanted to be who she was. And her name was Martha, a witness at that time before my dad uh, um, married her and to have one kid after another just you know until you get to that 13 range and you want to stop having children. Uh, she was just a great mom. I, I don't know what else I could tell you. In fact that there are so many ups and downs and so many painful things, so many tough ways to go. My mom was always there. She was she was one of the best women or ladies I ever know in my life. She was just a great mom. She was also from uh, Springfield, Nebraska. And I remember a lot of memories. I remember when my uh, four brothers were in the military and, 
and they and she was just a, a lover of her children. She loved children. When my brothers came home, one of my brothers came home uh, being uh, injured in the military. Uh, and I remember one day, a special day to me, uh, who my mom was. Uh, I remember one day I, I went to the house and she was there and, and she was crying at the, at the screen door. And, and I looked at her and I said, Mom, why are you crying? And all she could say is, you wouldn't understand, honey, you wouldn't understand. But it's because she was upset about my brother being injured in the military. And, he was shot, right? Yeah, and, uh, and he survived and he did well. And once he got healed up and everything, and I think all the credit goes to my mom. But uh, she, uh, she did so many things that I can't even remember. His work was just trying to get everything done that needed to be done. He, uh, he had corn, he had alfalfa with the bales of hay. He had uh, uh, animals, uh, chickens, pigs, and cows, and all that stuff. And I, at, at uh, eight years old, I learned how to milk a cow. So, so I know what it's like uh, on the farm to be a busy guy. And, and my dad had so many responsibilities. And, and one, one thing I always didn't like about my dad, he smoked a lot of cigarettes. And, uh, and he blew a lot of smoke, and it was like he rode his own. And that was one of his pet things that he wanted to do, is make sure he always had cigarettes to smoke. My dad, uh, when I turned nine, we moved from the farm into the city. And, and my dad, by the second day, worked at the Omaha Stockyards. Um, and I was real close to my dad. It was my, one of my brothers that worked part-time at the Omaha Stockyards when we moved from the farm to the city. He, um, he died of a massive heart attack, and you know, I just turned nine years old. Some memories I don't really like to think about, but every now and then I do think about them, and and uh, I, I I just it was really hard as a kid trying to grow up uh, to be a man, especially like my older brothers. We were very stubborn, very stubborn. And like, because it's dad's way and my mom's way, uh, they try to buck against that and they found out it didn't work. And because uh, mom and dad really made sure that who was running the household, so. Well, when you have girls in a household, it seems like you have about a dozen of them, but I had five sisters and they were all going every which direction, but uh, they, were, they were good and my sisters were uh, they were close, stuck close to mom. Mom was teaching them how to cook, how to do things around the house, and so forth. So um, I didn't. I was not around the house a lot. I was always outside doing something that was to, uh, to uh, help my mom or help my dad if I knew it was something I needed to take care of. I have uh, my sister Betty, uh, sister De Dorothy. Uh, sister uh, Carol, Sister uh, um, Shirley, and Sister Dolores. That should be five. <laughs> I had seven brothers, and I was, uh, I'll was i go from the youngest, so I'll try to get it right. The youngest uh, was me, and then I had a brother Ron, and then brother uh, uh, Richard, uh, brother Howard, brother Kenneth, brother Willis, brother Gordon, brother Leroy. I was closest to my brother um, uh, Kenneth at one time, and then become and became Gordon uh, because they they were like fighters, you know. They would get a couple guys and get together and go to a bar in Springfield, Nebraska, and they go in there and see who can clean out the bar, you know. And that kind of thing. And when they get home, they come home late, and, and uh, my mom didn't like it, and she would get after them and were getting in some kind of troubles and stuff like that. But they weren't afraid to you tell her what it was all about. And my brother Ron and I, we just kind of stuck together and played with our little toys that we got, uh, and just playing and staying away from the older kids, you know. But that didn't last very long because the following year, I remember. I, my brother Ron and I had to start doing chores like the rest of my brothers. 
and sisters I'm taking care of uh, seven Jersey cows and milking them and uh, putting the bucket in between your legs and, and just go to work, you know, and that's the way it was, you know, that's the way we got our milk and all of our eggs and all that stuff. You know, was, uh, my sister Dorothy was very instrumental in all of that in helping. She was a helper and she just uh, kind of was like an assistant coach. Dorothy was like a mom because when my mom died, uh, she she became like my mom. Um, she was she was just so awesome and she was great. Um, she got uh, one thing I always remember about her: how proud she was to be able to sing a song with the Everly Brothers back in their day. And the Everly Brothers uh, was back from uh, Cal Anaheim, California, is where I was at that time in my life and and. Um, my sister got to sing one song with the Everly Brothers, and I can't remember what the song was, but and I remember the Everly Brothers, and like maybe some of you know about them, but but they were they went to a high school right nearby where we lived, where Dorothy lived, and uh, so Dorothy was, yeah, she was very instrumental in in keeping things together. I, I had a grandma I met her one time, and and she was at that time she was ninety some years old. 92, I think, and my mother's mom, and and uh, I saw her one time. That was the last time I saw her there in Springfield, Nebraska. But she lived in Papaya, Nebraska. If you want to know where Papaya is, it's a little Indian town way back, away from the farms. So we went to uh, a one-room country school, uh, and it was uh, uh, probably had maybe at the most had 22 students. Uh, and we had, uh, I had a um, teacher and, uh, and she was a teacher for eight grades. Um, she did from first grade to eighth. She was an uh, awesome teacher, um, had a lot of respect for her. She did a good job and, and but uh, it was about two and a half miles from school, from our home. We had to you know, walk it. We had, my dad at times had to hitch up a team of horses and a wagon because the roads would be so muddy or snow or whatever. And he would put us on that uh, wagon, hay wagon, and take us to school. And that really was tough because we had to get up early to get chores done and all that stuff and still get, get to school and, and do what we had to do there. The Golden Pen story is one of the uh, stories because I was, um, I had the, the best printing and the best, the best writing that uh, all the kids had in the school. I took, I don't know, it was just a gift for me because I could write, I could print, and I could outdo anybody, anybody that was older than me and the teacher could understand what I was writing and, and what I was other than that. Um, she was a great teacher. She would show all the different letters you had to learn and put it down on paper. And it was, it was, uh, it was quite a ordeal there. I think it was hand, well, it was my handwriting. It was being a, like a writer. She would let me write for a lot of kids at times. All my friends were my, were my brothers. The rest of the guys that, that were my age and that, they lived farther away from us, but yet went to the same school. So I, I didn't get to know any of them, but so my brothers were, were the ones. When we moved to um, uh, Omaha, from the farm to Omaha, of course, a lot of things happened there, my dad dying and so forth. And then, then uh, shortly after that, my oldest brother, he just thought it'd be better for my mom because I had my sister Dorothy and her husband and my brother Willis and his wife all moved, moved to Anaheim, California. And my oldest brother made the decision that that uh, he would take us and move us out to California. And I didn't want to go, but I ended up going and, and I'm glad I did because it's one of the best things that I've had it happened to me in my time from Nebraska to California. My mom died. Well, she was she was uh, she was sick uh, for a while there when we was living there in Omaha, and, and when we got to uh, California, we found out that she had breast cancer and, and that uh, she would eventually have to have surgery and so forth. And um, we were li living with my sister Dorothy at the time and uh, we moved there in Anaheim, California, about a mile from Disneyland. And uh, 
And when uh, we found out that she had to go back to California, or to Nebraska, when she did go back there uh, with her situation, she was going through my brother's garage and there was some oil on the floor there that she didn't see and she stepped on it and it, she slipped and fell and uh, hurt her, uh, her knees real bad. And uh, so they took her to a doctor for emergency and when they took a uh, picture of it and everything, they also found out that she had bone cancer. So she died back there while I was still back in Anaheim, California. Anaheim was a great place to be. Uh, there was uh, 50,000 people in the in the city of uh, Anaheim, uh, and and not uh, knowing anything about Anaheim High School and so forth. I really liked the state a lot at that time, but I wanted to know where I was going to go to school because at that time in Omaha, as when I went to my first year of junior high, I really took to football and basketball. Um, the rest of it came later, but anyhow, uh, going to California and and able to go to one of the top high schools in the country at that time, and I had one of the top high school coaches at that time that I played for, Claire Van Horovac, and he was an awesome coach, awesome, and uh, he uh, he taught me more about life. He was a Christian man, <coughs> and. Uh, if it wasn't for him, I, I don't know where I'd be sitting here today. Uh, the things I was doing wrong, I had bad habits, so he helped me to get my life straight and, and, and get it going. And once he, I, I found out that even though I wasn't a big guy, I was about 150 pounds, but he uh, saw things in me that he thought I could be good for his football team. He wanted me to play, and, and uh, yeah, I told him I had some experience back in in Nebraska, but uh, it wasn't for him. I, I, like I said, he became like my father because uh, my dad died when I was nine back in Omaha, and uh, so I had nobody to turn to other than my sister and, and my brother that lived back there and my my mom and that. And uh, but once I got into the school, things changed for the good. I got into uh, a school that. Uh, was a three-year high school. Junior, you got your sophomore, junior, and senior year, and I would happen to be going into my my uh, sophomore year, and <clears throat> and my brother Ron was also there too. But um, I became a football player. I became a basketball player. Dropped basketball and uh, went on to be a wrestler on the wrestling team. And then I was a track man. I was on the track team because I was second fastest on the football team and track team. So I had a lot of speed. You know, how I developed all that speed, I don't know. It was probably the way I was trained and how he had to do things on the farm and all. But Gene Donnelly was one of the uh, instrumental guys that was my trainer. And uh, he was a trainer for, our, for a guy. He was like a doctor. He was really good. And then uh, in the we had, uh, uh, at that time when we had injuries, we had the hot tub, you know, and, and so forth. But he was very instrumental in my life. And and, uh, and I surely, all the guys, all the coaches were people that just uh, really treated me like, like I was good because they, they liked me because I was a tough guy. You know, I had to be tough. I had brothers beating up on me every now and then. And uh, they called me a big crybaby if I cried or anything like that. And they would hit me and knock me around every now and then just to toughen me up. And uh, so that kind of went with me uh, when I moved to Omaha and played my first year of high school there, my, South, or my, no, my uh, June seventh grade year at Omaha South High. And uh, I was really good at football then. I was uh, punt return kickoff return and the other two and then I was uh, a starting defensive corner. Football was my favorite sport. Um, wrestling was good because it was a discipline really it, it taught me a lot of discipline and how to be strong and be not afraid you know or anything like that but yeah it was and then track was great because I I build up my speed my 
and being one of the fastest guys on the team, uh, I, I had three great years there at Anaheim High School. It's one of the best coaching staffs. I went to Orange Coast College my first year. As a sophomore year, and I had a bad uh, knee at that time. I played uh, uh, two years with a torn cartilage in my knee, and I had to have my knee drained out uh, every twice a week. Uh, the doctor would come in. I was a, a, our team doctor, and he'd come and, and take the fluid out of that knee. Well, just to get by that, uh, he was great and all that, and I was able to finish my two years of high school with a torn cartilage, and I never missed a practice, and never missed a game. Anaheim High School was rated uh, number uh, no, le no less than eight and seven every year, uh, being uh, one or two of the top uh, high schools in, in the state of California. If anybody's heard of modern day high school, we played them and beat them. And uh, <laughs> anyhow, just the surrounding of, uh, of all the different schools and different uh, coaches and, and different players and all that, it, it was it was a, a real strong, hard growing up time for my, for my life because uh, I, I was involved in so many things and now I'm, my dad died of a heart attack, my mom died of breast cancer and trying to find my way what is going to be good for me but my, my brother, uh, a couple of my brothers really helped me along a bit. My sister Dorothy and her husband were very instrumental in, in my life. Sports uh, had a great big uh, impact on my life because without it, I don't know where I'd been. I, I know I would have gotten myself in trouble, uh, but because the coaches kept everybody on a straight and narrow way, you know, like, you know, make sure that you take care of business. And they were very instrumental in that because I was able to get my life together more and because of them helping me, if I had some problems with a certain subject, they would sit down and work with me. So our coaches were very instrumental in being who they were and, and why they win. It's because they really took good care of our, our players and whatever the sport they played, they was always there to help them. 1960, yeah, we, we won two, uh, uh, state, uh, two championships. Uh, it was... If we lost, uh, didn't win it, is because we lost to a really good team, which was Santa, Santa Ana. And uh, so, well, later on in life, uh, <laughs> Jim Coleman, uh, I was uh, in, uh, living in California at the time. Uh, Jim Coleman was uh, an ex-player. He played for Bear, Paul Bear Bryant at Alabama. And uh, Jim Coleman had, uh, six boys. Uh, he, his mom, uh, his wife uh, prayed for six brown-eyed boys. She got six brown-eyed boys and every one of them were very good football players and good athletes. And I grew up with uh, a lot of those kids and Jim Coleman who was, who was a federal probation officer in his job and, and uh, Joanne, uh, his wife, was the, the mother and she took good care of the kids and she, she called me her seventh son. Um, so, just to, to get to know Jim Coleman and his family was just an unbelievable thing because my, my buddy Jim Kong, Coleman, it was Jim Coleman, but I call him the Kong, <laughs> but uh, he and I became the best of buddies and um, he, he, Jim Coleman, when he, he was uh, the most sought after running back back in that day. And, and he uh, he decided to go to Bear, Paul Bear Bryant, and he was uh, out to go to uh, to uh, um, Georgia, and uh, he was one of the top running backs. He weighed about 220, and it was about 6'3", and, and uh, but he got a severe uh, in his first double day practice when he was playing ball uh, for Bear Bryant. He uh, got two bro two broke. Uh, he had two breaks in one leg, and he had to have uh, three different surgeries and it ended his football career because he would have been great. So he was a very bright guy, just like his wife. His wife, which uh, was like my mom, and she was so bright. She was so great. And uh, but Jim was a man that he he had um, a real strong 
uh, way of bringing up uh, his his boys, and uh, he was very strong, very right to the point. And uh, when I came into the family, just being around them, he called me his seventh son. And uh, we did a lot of things together. And when I, I, I'll tell you, he was such a funny man, a very strong, very smart man. He could do a lot of things. And but what we did is, uh, whenever we wanted to go to a different school to see him play, we would drive up to Cincinnati or go to Pennsylvania. He just wanted to go see where they had good high school football. So. I, I, I had this thing where he was so funny, I would laugh all the way to that school and all the way back. <laughs> he had so many different jokes and things that he would talk about. I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was quite the relationship we had. And, and then, of course, he, uh, he uh, passed away uh, about eight or nine years ago. And, and his, uh, his wife is still living. She's in her 90s. And uh, so... Who were the Sisters of the Poor? <laughs> the Sisters of the Poor was a bunch of you, of uh, the uh, uh, Kentucky football players. <laughs> That's what he called Sisters of the Poor. He did, they didn't. He said that they didn't know what football was all about. If they had to play uh, Kentucky uh, year after year, they uh, they would have never beat Kentucky. But that was his. Uh, the Sisters of the Poor were the schools that couldn't play kind of football that foot that uh, Alabama couldn't play, you know. Yeah, as far as he would say, he, he wouldn't spend a dime to go see them play a ball game here in Kentucky. But when his boys ended up signed up playing football, he played, or he, he would go to their games, but he didn't like the way they coached their kids there at uh, Kentucky. So they went to different schools. Just the thing about Alabama and, and Kentucky, I was a Kentucky fan for quite a while until he came along. But his boys play, had two boys playing for Alabama that, that, that I played ball with. The whole family, we went to Tuscaloosa, Alabama and to be out there for spring football. And, uh, and that was one of the best ex experiences I had of football when I first, when we got out there in the, in the first day of spring football, um, I go to the football field, and uh, all the guys would be out there. The guys that the players for uh, for Alabama, they were the guys that were the top players and really good players, you know. And, uh, and his office was about a block away, where he would come out of his office and get in his golf cart, and he would come up to the, the practice field. And he had a high tower. Bear Bryant got out of the out of the golf cart, and he would look down. He would even look at the players. He just looked down and climbed that ladder up to the high tower. And the only thing I remember was awesome was that gentleman. He had a bullhorn. He get that bullhorn. He said, "Gentlemen, it's time to go to work." And I'm telling you, it wasn't but about five minutes. You see some hard hitting and getting after it. That was the biggest thing in my life, to how he, how he trained his guys to be ready for football. And it was a following game at, uh, at the LA Coliseum with, uh, against uh, uh, USC at, uh, at the LA Coliseum, packed, over 100,000 people. Guess who was a ball, guess who was uh, the man who had, had tearaway jerseys back then? Who was the guy that was given the job of, of supplying the players that came off with torn jerseys, I had to finish ripping the jerseys off. The players that had to, I had to put a, their number back on there, you know, New Jersey, and that was my job. And they and they paid me a hundred dollars for that to do. The Alabama won by I think by two or three points. It was one of the best football games I ever seen. Favorite food: steak and eggs. Steak and eggs. Oh, I love it. Lots of pies. My mom would make a lot of pies, so I ate a lot of pies, a lot of sugar. She loved brownies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Back in California, we lived about a mile away from Disneyland. And uh, I, mean, I had to get a job, you know, I had to go to work. I got a job uh, 
accountant Uncle Walt's money at the cash control department. It was one of the best jobs I ever have. Even today, it would be one of my best jobs. And it was just a great job. But uh, I was making $2.10 an hour, you know, and I thought that was 100 bucks an hour, you know, to me. And, uh, but I loved working there. After that, I, I uh, got into coaching. I started coaching Pop Warner football. And when I coached Pop Warner football, some of the kids that, that, uh, that I had grew up a little bit and, and were some pretty good players. But after um, I got to the point when I graduated from Anaheim High School, I decided I, I want to get into more coaching. So I started getting on the coaching staff there and I coached about uh, well, probably 31 years there at Anaheim High School coaching high school football between foot, Pop Warner and junior high and all that. Um, then, of course, when I moved out here to uh, Kentucky, I, I started coaching again when I was out of coaching, trying to make a living, working jobs that I had to work. Fire Safety First was, was a really good job I had. It was taking care of, you know, doing the recharging of uh, fire extinguishers and, and doing that for uh, apartment complexes and all that. They had to have several uh, boxes to where it had to be uh, 10 pound fire extinguishers. I did that for three years and uh, that was really a good job for me and make, I made good money doing that. I, I got into coaching again and then I started thinking what, I, what do I want to do to make my career more feasible and, and just uh, something that I really like to do. And I thought about it, did some other things uh, that I don't want to mention. Oh, a roughneck on an oil rig. That was right after, it was about a year or two after I, I graduated from high school. Um, I got on a, a job um, where we uh, drilled for oil. Uh, and uh, so I got on a job, I took the job because it paid me nine bucks an hour where I was making 210 an hour. So I did that job. It was one of the most ridiculous jobs I've ever done, but I worked it for two years being a roughneck on an oil rig. And I was one of the smallest guys that worked on that rig. You know, you offshore and onshore drilling. And uh, I had a friend that played on our team. He's the one that got me the job there. And he was the chain man and I was the tong man. And uh, we'd be drilling and going down the hole and uh, or going out of the hole. It was some of the hardest work I ever done. And it really taught me a lot about being um, just, you had to get after it. It's all you, if you want to make that money, and do all the dirty work that you have to do. That's what I did. Me and my buddy, that was the lineman for us on our football team. I had one threat to me. <laughs> I had a threat with a guy who was a Derrick man and he was about six foot six, and about 300 pounds, you know. And uh, he was he was one of the guys you just didn't want to mess with. And and we I, I don't know if you know what a mud pit is where you have to have the hot mud going down through the pipes and everything to keep the bit, the, the bit cool when you hit rock or anything. Well, that you had to keep that mud flowing, you know. And uh, so, and then we had the Derrick man, when he would send a pipe back to you, which is a foot, 50 foot uh, long pie, a pipe. And uh, he told me that I got to work faster and, and, and get after it more, or, or he was going to have to do something about it. And I didn't like the guy who was our drill, our guy who was in charge of it. He was a jerk, you know. Everything that he did, he cussed at you. And if you made a mistake, he'd call you everything in the book, try to get you to do what you were supposed to do. The Derrick man was the guy I was afraid of because he, I told him uh, that he was a big jerk because uh, he, he said something to me and I didn't like it. And he took me and picked me up and threw me in the mud pit. <laughs> And that was that. <laughs> I, didn't, I let him be who he was, and he did a good job. And <laughs> that was that was one of the highlights of my life. You know, he picked me up like I was a rag doll. You know, handling 50 foot, foot pipes. You know, like he was doing all the time. He was strong as a mule.
1967, I, I have to go back to that because I became uh, a, a Christian. I was my, my football coach was a Christian coach. And I liked the way he handled kids and he handled life. Um, he uh, taught me a lot of things and took a lot of things that I was doing the wrong things a lot. And he just made me uh, feel more comfortable about telling him who I was and what I liked and what I didn't like and all that. But he said, hey, son, you just have to grow up. You're just going to have to grow up and become a man. And, and I, tell, I can tell you this, I can tell you to be a man of God. If you're a man of God, you'll be fine. And uh, so from that point on, in 1967, I gave my life to the Lord. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. And knowing who I am today and what I got today in my life, can't can't uh, ask for anything more than having a son and three daughters. And I got 12, really 12 uh, grandkids. And that keeps me real busy taking care of them every now and then. Yeah, my life is, uh, is very, very difficult at times. and But if I had to do it all over again, I know that if God would say, this is how you do it, don't do it that way, stay away from this, stay away from that. There's a lot of rotten people out there, but there's a lot of good people, you know. And, and I just, uh, I just think that uh, with me being becoming a Christian, it really taught me a lot about life, and it taught me a lot of uh, when you don't know people, or if you know people who are not Christian people. I just try to let my lifestyle be the picture for them, and why I do this and why I did this. We used to do this, and now I do this now in my way. It's, it's my life I have with, with the Lord, and I love people. I love whether they're Christian or non-Christian. I, I care about them. I pray about them and for them. And, and um, I coached uh, the last 12 of my years. I uh, coached at the LCA, Lexington Christian Academy, and uh, I took over as a uh, as their uh, Bible uh, teacher. Faith was, was the main thing once I got to LCA and become, I wanted to be a minister for the kids on the football team. And that's probably the best, the, the greatest thing that's happened to me because I was able to uh, share the gospel of Jesus Christ to those kids. And that meant more to me than football or anything else. But it was uh, the, 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 uh, the the time that I was able to spend with those boys from junior high to high school uh, was one of the uh, greatest experiences I ever had. And seeing how those kids, when they graduated from the school uh, in their senior year, I have a, a scrapbook about that thick with all the kids would write me a letter and tell me how important it was for me to do, to have Bible study with them, and it really made the difference in their life. So that made uh, made my life made my life a lot different uh, than the way I, I look at it now. They call me Coach Bob, and uh, that was uh, that was a great experience to be able to. Even though I I let my coaching uh, drop after my first year of coaching junior, I coached junior high. I had to, but my main reason was I wanted to uh, have the the gospel of Jesus Christ to share with the kids. Well, we started with you. When you were born, you were, I remember a, a friend of mine that uh, played for Bear Bryant. Uh, he looked at Jason when Jason was uh, just a little guy in the crib yet. And the first thing I thought was, <laughs> was a big kick was when he said, wow, what a whopper this guy is. You know, <laughs> so I didn't, <laughs> you were the first and I always thought I would have three or four boys, but it was just one. Cause I had three daughters came along after that, uh, but uh, my uh, my experience with my kids was probably the most important thing in my life. And my my, my son is uh, he was always the one that kept me going, making sure I I was doing the right things and to uh, treat people the way you want to be treated, um, and just. Uh, Knowing that uh, what you were going to be, uh, I know that one thing that was most impressive with you is that 
uh, when you turned to be old enough to watch TV and watch TV, it was uh, chips. Um, and that, from that one day, you made a statement like, I'm going to be a uh, police officer. And uh, I said, well, that's a very hard job to do. It's a very dangerous job, but it's very rewarding. He said, I, I want to be a, I want to be a, I want to be like chips. I said, well, you're not going, you're not going to play, you're not going to be chips when it comes to the motorcycle, because I don't want you to be riding the motorcycle. You got to make sure you get in the car if you go that way. And I got to do two ride-alongs with you. And uh, boy, like I said, I tell people that people don't, people don't know and understand what, what uh, these people have to go through to take care of situations. My most important, the best son uh, is Jason. He was my only son. And, uh, but if I had other sons, I know they'd be somewhat like him. He, he was good at everything he did. I mean, basketball, he's a basketball player and he was a football player. And, and uh, I just had a lot of fun trying to coach him as he was growing up a little bit. And, and I just, uh, I learned a lot of football being a Nebraska Cornhusker, you know. And, and I know what my brothers were like and, and how they loved Nebraska football and all. And, and then and later on in my life, you know, and, I got. I have a son of my own. I thought I'd have at least three sons, but I had three daughters. So, but uh, but he was he was my only uh, son, and and he uh, brought a lot of uh, great uh, fun and respect and all that to what he did. Well, we got Rebecca, we got Bethany, and we got guess who? Rachel. And they're all Bible characters. You're a Bible character, by the way. You know, I, I told that to you. Your name, Jason, is in the Bible. Rebecca, she was uh, very strong in her belief. And uh, she said that she wanted to be just like me. About her just wanting to, she just wanted to hang on me. She would grab me by the neck and everything. And she would always tell me how much she loved me. Do you remember Rebecca got fast? Do you remember how competitive Rebecca was? She was quiet, but competitive. She was very competitive, she, but she didn't care that much about sports. Bethany, she was, she was the female athlete. <laughs> she was my female athlete. She played basketball for Lafayette, and she played uh, softball for Lafayette, and then got a full ride scholarship to Camelsville University on a softball scholarship. And she was really, really good. She was a great outfielder. She had speed, she could run. And uh, I remember when she was just a little girl and they were uh, taking time out for who was the fastest one to get from home plate to first base. And you know, you had to swing the bat and then drop the bat and you had to go and then you had to be clocked. Well, she, she beat everybody. <laughs> and there were girls older than she was when it was her first uh, practice, you know, and she was the fastest girl on the team. So since we're talking about my sisters, and we'll get to Rachel here in a second, Esperanza High School, you, we'd go there. Yeah. And you remember Rebecca and Bethany would race me. Right. Yeah. How did uh, that go? Tell, tell me about that. Uh, uh, well, um, you, uh, you, you, uh, were, you were so fast at that time. But they, they, they always, always told me, they said, Daddy, well, can I be as fast as Jason, Uncle Jason, not Uncle Jason, but Jason? My, my daughters would say, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm more, I don't want to be as big as he is. Well, my mother was a redhead. <laughs> and I mean, she was a redhead. Boy, whatever she said, you know, it had to go. And uh, so, I always thought, well, all the kids I got, all my grandkids, and then all of a sudden, here comes Rachel, and she's got red hair. Out of all the redheads in my family, and I got a lot of family uh, females that are, you know, connected in the, my relationships, but she was the only one that had the red hair. My mother, she was very, very stubborn, very stubborn. She didn't like uh, people telling her what to do. Uh, she. Uh, she, uh, I think, uh, 
Uh, as you know, your mother and I had a divorce, and that made it, I think it made it really hard for her. She she thought that she was going to be the athlete because what she would do, she would if she got mad at me or somebody, she'd get real mad and stomp her feet, and she would start getting in, and she'd come and she would just hit her head right in your belly, and some of them were low blows. Rachel. And that, Rachel, yeah, and I thought she would be the athlete. But she was, she was, and she didn't want anything to do with it, uh, being, and she didn't like the idea to have the practice and all that stuff. But as it is right now, she's got, she's got two boys, and I think one of them's going to be a linebacker, because he is a, he is a hoss, and he's only what five years old. <laughs> he is. The worst one was the um, towers. That that was the worst. Of, of all my what I've witnessed, <clears throat> uh, I, I, at that time when everything was going on, everybody saying that that was uh, somebody was attacking us from another country and and all that, and I'm thinking first thing I start to think about is my family. Uh, what do I do? Where do I go? What should I do? And all that, and uh, um, that was really a hard time for me because I was in the selling athletic sporting goods. I, that was my career. I did it for 20, about 25 years, selling athletic game gear to uh, working with the athletic directors from high schools and Little League football and all that. I did that for about 25 years. And that was one of the best jobs I ever had. You know, love one another as he has loved us. So that's uh, that would be the first thing I started off with them. And then I started off uh, uh, with my granddaughters uh, where I wanted them to memorize some of the scriptures that I taught them and that and uh, Aubrey as you well know she remembers three of them from the Bible when she was just four years old so that's what I what I uh, really uh, had in my mind was to make sure that I treat them right from wrong and make sure that you're accountable for your actions and uh, don't hide your weaknesses or anything like that, you come to mom, you come to dad, or you go to a coach that you can trust or whatever. But I always wanted them to know that uh, that I was always there for them. Now the roughest sport I ever played was wrestling. Football, track was easy to play compared to wrestling. Wrestling, if you didn't know, if you did know what you were doing, you are going to be called canvas back because you're going to be on your back. And that means you've been pinned and you lost. When I had to learn that in my sophomore year, but in my junior and senior year, I could handle myself pretty good because I learned it just from wrestling, how to protect myself. Oh yeah, I would change some things. Things that I know that I shouldn't have done. I would, if I wouldn't have done it, I would have been a better person. If I would listen to more people like my coach that um, would give me some good um, advice in leading me to a better situation if they thought that I was not doing what I should be doing as a husband or along with my children, being a father. There's just a lot of things that uh, that I had to learn and coming up from a situation where I had seven brothers I had to deal with all the time. I did, I had to deal with until we moved to town and then they pretty much split up and got married and all that, but uh, it was hard growing up as a young kid. But loving my daughters the, is the most important thing to me and while I'm here on earth. I want to be the best dad I can be. I want them to be proud of me. I want them to be proud of me because I love their grand their children you know and they and they like and they love to be around me i want them to know that not only am i a godly man i want them to know that i am a man that is about doing what is right and i want my girls my 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 girls and my grandchildren to grow up to be who they are in christ not in just their immediate world well this pappy my my children, um, I just want them to know that 
I, I want, I, my, my main objective when you came into this world is that I want to be the best pappy that I can be for you. That you can always come to me and I can always be there for you if, if, if that was the, the case, you know. But I want my kids, my children, I want them to know that Pappy will be there for him if he's able and willing and to do and to lead you to doing what is right and then give it your best that you've got every day because we're not guaranteed the tomorrows. We take care of today and be the best that we can be today. So this is why my, my hope and prayer for you all is that you take your energy and put most of that energy into knowing who you are in God. You didn't get planted here just by some uh, t little thing from falling from the sky. You know, you are a child of the living God. So when they go to a ball game and uh, they think that they are going to be able to have a great game or a great season or anything, uh, forget that because um, when you have uh, uh, a guy like Jim Coleman uh, telling <laughs> who the sisters of the poor are, he says it's called Kentucky football. Uh, well, the coaches, when I, when I was playing at Anaheim High School, uh, the kids would get out there talking and doing things that, you know, they're just being kind of goofy. And the coach would see him do that, and the coach would come up, and our coach says, all right, that's enough of that kind playing grab fanny. No more grab fanny. And, uh, and what do you mean gra grab fanny, coach? And he grabbed his his rear end and said, "That's his grab fanny." He was patting each other on the on the rear end like you did something great. He said, "No, no more um, grab fanny. It's not allowed. Uh, doing something silly." Um, I think uh, Alabama. And the reason why I say that is because I saw them play for a long time, and I saw the kind of game that they played against one of the top-notch schools. In, uh, in the L.A. Coliseum, and, uh, I think USC had some of the top players, but I'd never seen guys with more discipline and more ready to play any game is where I, where I got to know some of the guys down there on the team. Got to wrestle one of the guys on the team too. Big guy, six foot six, uh, six, set about six seven, weighed about 290. He was a defensive uh, 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 tackle for Kentucky, not for Kentucky, but Alabama. Pro football team, I like Green Bay Packers. I can't help it because I was like uh, Coach Van Brocklin. <laughs> How, how's a guy getting millions of dollars? He was one of the uh, highest paid coaches to come to Texas A&M and has, the, and has a couple teams that I've seen so far that couldn't beat the sisters of the poor. I don't know, one of the things, one of my highlights has to be <laughs> when I ran track. Uh, I had to play against a guy who was six foot six the, from Western High School in Anaheim, California. And uh, this guy was uh, their tight end. And uh, he was a big strapping guy and fast. And he, was, he wasn't fat or anything, he was just a tall, slender guy, but really put together. He had muscles and everything. And uh, that's one, one, one time we lost a game and he was a tight end. And, uh, and he beat us because he called a touchdown pass on me. And it really ticked me off. I had it in for him for the rest of my life, we might say. And uh, so I found out that he was on the track team and I was on the, our track team and he was on their track team and he was a 400 meter yard runner. That's one time around, you know? And I was a track guy too. I was on the relay team and everything. But I, I ran the 440, that, that's what they called it. And uh, he ran the, that same 440. And I, and I just looked at him, I didn't say nothing to him. And, and he was one of the fastest, he had the fastest time. My time was not as good as his time when we met. And uh, so we took off and we kind of were on you know, the straightaway, we were kind of going, you know, even, you know. There was two other guys running with us and I wasn't worried about them, but I knew what I could do, but I didn't know what this guy could do. 
But anyhow, uh, when you turn the first turn, come down the stretch, then I start kicking it in, getting more to it, and he was just, we were about side by side, and then he started pulling ahead of me, and I said, I'll let him, I'll let him get into the turn, and then I'm going to hold some spit for him. <laughs> so when I turned the corner and I kicked it into high gear, and he was, and I got a picture of it too, by the way, and I, and as soon as I I got to him, I looked at him, and I spit at him, I said, come catch me if you can. And I beat him, and that day, that track meet, I beat him. And that was one of the highlights of my life, because I got back at him. I, I <laughs> so, you know, for a long time, I've tried to find a way, or thought about ways to, to really honor my dad, um, and his legacy, and his impact on people. And a video like this, um, priceless uh, a video like this being able for grandkids great grandchildren and generations to come to be able to to know who this man is um, is extremely important and uh, I'm I'm just thrilled to be able to do this project um, you know it's funny because growing up everybody has superheroes that they love from Marvel and all that kind of stuff and I I never had to go outside my house to find my superhero because that was my dad and uh, <laughs> I just I, I can't believe the impact this man has had on people's lives and the most the most important thing that I can do as his son um, is to share this legacy. That was a caring guy uh, a caring, a caring um, and everything I tried to do in my upbringing is try to be a person that cared about others than just myself. Um, I wanted to be the best dad that I could be, the best husband I could be. That I wanted somebody to, to be able to come to me and, and that it would be between me and him or me and her, uh, if it was my children or somebody else's children. Well, first of all, first I, I say I want you to make sure that you're right with God. That's my first thing, that uh, there is no other thing that came into my mind other than the fact that you be the best kind of person that you can be. Make sure that you are doing the right things to the best of your ability. Nobody's perfect, I understand that. But the thing is, we still need leadership and leadership came to me once I gave my life to the Lord and now I know what kind of person I need to be and that isn't hard to do because I know who I am I know where I'm going when this life is done and over with I know where I'm going I know it's I know it's the truth I I just know I can talk to God anytime I want to